All right, so last time we talked about some big picture stuff about programming for gyms, programming for group classes, programming for people with a wide variety of goals, a wide variety of backgrounds, a wide variety of athletic abilities and desires from the gym, which is challenging, right? And some of the main takeaways that we talked about is finding this balance between what people want and what people need, right? So if you're a coach, you have some idea about best practices, some idea about the way that programming should look and what people need to be doing to achieve what you perceive their goals to be. And that's not always, not always in alignment with what people think they should be doing, right? That a lot of folks who are coming into the gym are like, okay, cool. I want to look this way. I want to perform this way, whatever. And the way to do that is to do the hardest thing possible every single day and to leave the gym in a body bag. And you as the coach are like, hey, listen, like maybe we should pull back a little bit. Let's try to find some consistency. Let's try to find some sustainability. We'll build over time. We'll see good results. And people are like, that sounds okay. But if I'm not leaving the gym in a body bag, like I didn't try hard enough. And so it's this constant push and pull for folks who, um, tend to come into CrossFit gyms, functional fitness gyms, assorted micro gyms that do hard stuff. And, you know, we talked about that from a, a zoomed out perspective last time. We're going to try to get kind of in the in the middle level this time about more specific things where we have to find this balance between what people want and what people need. And so, you know, again, I own a gym, have programmed for affiliates uh, for years, right, at gyms that uh, I worked at previously, have done some affiliate programming for people, um, you know, where they hired me to write programming for them. Luke similarly has written programming for multiple different gyms, uh, trying try to find this difficult balance. So yeah, we, we're just going to fire off some ideas about ways to find this balance in, in spots that it may catch you by surprise, especially if you are someone who is a coach, right? Who's maybe a head coach at a gym, an owner of a gym, whatever. And, and you have a lot of trust and buy-in from athletes. And then you're starting to try to step back a little bit, coach less and program for people. There's a, there's a pretty challenging um, gap to cross there between you being the one who's leading the classes and is like, hey, listen, today we're going to do this. Everyone here has poor stability. And so we're going to do some side planks and it's going to be awesome. And over time, we're going to actually get better at side planks and that's going to help everyone. And people are like, yes, side planks. And then, you know, you have uh, Jimmy come in who just got his level one and he's going to take the morning classes. It's going to help your, help your schedule out. And Jimmy's like, okay, today we're going to do side planks. And people are like, boo side planks like i don't want to do side planks like why aren't we maxing out our power clean and doing murph and then you know it's it's much harder for jimmy to get people to want to do side planks than it is for you the head coach the owner the programmer whatever to actually get buy-in from folks so you know that, that that's a, a a very challenging dynamic to to kind of figure out and to balance the program with something that people want to do are excited to do the coach can implement people have trust in the coach and are willing to follow it and aren't just going to argue and push back and complain about not doing hard enough stuff all the time. So, you know, I think that's one of the first things to think about is like, okay, what can you get a coach to successfully implement that people will enjoy and have trust in? Not just what you as a coach who has the trust of the community, who has the respect of the community, who can handle pushback, right? Where the, the outspoken member is like, well, I think we should do it this way. And you're like, well, actually, you know, that's a good point, but here's why we're doing it this way. And then that actually like builds trust and creates engagement. Whereas someone who doesn't have that level of, you know, confidence or knowledge or whatever to take feedback from a member and then sort of explain to them in a helpful way, you know, that can be a, something that actually erodes trust in that class and then makes it harder the next time it's like guess what we're doing side plays again and it's like well last time we argued with you and you didn't have a good answer so we don't trust you so we're just gonna like argue again and it's gonna sort of go downhill from there yeah i think the uh one of the things that comes to mind with how to sort of i mean balance what people want and what you're you, what they need and what you're trying to give them is i think each gym sort of has its culture around the training, right? It's, you know, you have some gyms which are a lot, a lot more competitive, value things, um, value, you know, um, the competitive nature of workouts. They sort of look to the CrossFit games. They try to create like a, a real buzz around the CrossFit Open. You have other gyms where maybe they value just being able to provide a good training service uh, holistic training service for all of their members and you have individuals there who do a bit of competition you have individuals there who are just sort of training for health and wellness um, and then 
some gyms as well, like I think they didn't really know what happens or they didn't really have like a culture. It's sort of, a, sometimes it can be a bit of a, um, off the sort of the, the whim of whatever is the taste for the month or whichever, you know, um, coaches doing the program for that, for that month. I mean, that was one of the things I found quite challenging working in a, in a previous gym was alternating months of, uh, training. Um, because I, I remember doing it and, um, I went to the gym and I sort of heard that they, that, you know, they, they, they had held OPEX courses at the gym. Um, and I know that they had coaches who were a little bit sort of invested in that process and that way of thinking around training. Um, however, the person who was actually programming for the gym, uh, was sort of a little bit more of a, say, CrossFit purist and, uh, would sort of program more CrossFit.com style stuff. And I would alternate each month. So every single month it was like a little bit more structure, a little bit more just like, you know, MGW and <laughs> like, you know, that type of stuff and maybe a 5k every couple of weeks. But it was, it was something that would actually. How was attendance on 5k there? Ah, uh, awful. Um, but <laughs> then it was like, sometimes it was sort of on those sessions, it would, that would be, uh, yeah, the program wouldn't be sort of released or whatever, what have you. Uh, however, I think, you know, one of the things I would say that was positive about that experience was there was a bit more of a blend after, after a while um, of the two styles. So we were sort of working a little bit more off of the same sheet and it wasn't necessarily just like, a, this is what I'm going to do, you know, just sort of swinging our um, intellectual balls around and trying to, <laughs> trying to like out-program each other on this type of thing you know who's going to make up the hardest workouts um but the culture of, of training getting back to that i think that that's something that's really important to understand and if you are looking to sort of change the programming in a gym or move it into a bit of a different direction it might take a little bit more work than just literally just changing it and creating a bit of hype around the next training cycle it might mean that you actually have to like start delivering a different message in classes you might have to start incorporating training which just you know, sort of eases out, like, let's say, for example, you, you're sort of trying to move uh, a little bit away from like a hoorah-rah CrossFit type programming, a little bit to something that's a little bit more structured, um, you know, Jimmy and his side planks and all that. Uh, if, if you want to do that, you've got to probably pull back a little bit on the amount of CrossFit you're doing and maybe start to include some other training things, but then also harness some of the things that people enjoy about the more competitive, traditional hard metcons and things like that um but doing it in sort of a, a bit of a different way you know like if you're if you're looking to sort of uh, use a bit more structure you know you can use that competitiveness and you could use you know some assault bike or rowing sprints or something like that and you know that necessarily isn't that isn't necessarily going to be as uh, demanding on the body as like a hard metcon or you know doing lots of different uh dynamic movements but at the same time you can still get a little bit of that competitive nature but i think first thing is just sort of figuring out a bit of a, okay, what is it that you say to your members about fitness? What is it that you say to, you know, incoming leads about fitness? What is it you're trying to, you know, you, are you talking about um, fitness in the community and competitive vibes and team workouts and that type of thing? Or are you talking about more of a sort of a holistic approach that's there for everyone and is going to be scalable for every single individual in the gym? Um, do you have people, you know, on your social media, do you have just people, you know, snatching with loads of muscles and muscle ups and everything like that all over your social media account? Or do you have individuals who are sort of engaging in, uh, more sort of just bodybuilding style training and stuff that's a little bit less flashy. So I think that that's something that's, uh, going to be key in trying to, to make sure that you get the right, um, program for you, Jim. Yeah, Luke, I think that the idea of culture is very important there, right? And as you mentioned, some of that is top down, where the way that you speak to people when they originally reach out, right? The way that you answer their questions during a consultation, the way that coaches talk about the point of a workout, the way that coaches talk about how to scale, how to modify, how to pace, all that kind of stuff does impact and dictate the culture of the way that people are going to approach their workouts. Simultaneously, though, you will see pockets of individuals, specific classes, specific groups or whatever that can actually dominate the culture and sort of change it, 
right? Where maybe you have a message that you as a business are putting out there about how you want people to approach training and how they should think about it and what you consider best practices to be. But if you have a group of eight people who show up every day at 6 a.m. who have their own idea of what training should look like, who have their own idea about how competitive things should be, who have their own idea about whether or not they should do side planks, right? That 6 a.m. class is potentially going to have a totally different culture than your noon class, than a 5.30 p.m. class, whatever. And there is an element of, yes, you can top down, say what you think things should be, but each group is going to have its own vibe. And you as a coach or you as a programmer or you as someone who's, you know, offering programming to a gym or something like that, you know, you, you may have to sort of deal with that and be like, okay, listen, like this group is going to do things the way that they think it should be done. And you can't necessarily dictate to them exactly how they're going to behave, right? So you kind of have to, there's a little bit of push and pull with that that isn't always comfortable, right? And, you know, some people can say, oh, well, that group's not a core values fit. So like, you need to kick them out of your gym. And it's like, yeah, sure. Like, good luck with that. You know, like, like there, there, there is obviously a line of disrespect or, you know, people who um, are trying to turn everything into a competition. You're like, yo, we're a chill community gym. Like you can't be doing that here, right? There is a line somewhere. um, But I think that this idea of just like, oh yeah, you can kick everyone out who's like not an ideal fit client. Like, give me a fucking break. You know, (laughs) if if you're a gym that has the ability to do that and has the, um, the business model to support that and the clientele to support that, you're in rarefied air and most gyms have to deal with the people who they have and they absolutely cannot afford to just be booting people out for um, not necessarily fully aligning with their vision of exactly how training should be. Yeah, because that, that, that's one of the things that happens. Like when you create a program, you sort of envisage, okay, this is how it's going to look. And I, I remember we mentioned in the last podcast, it's just there's so much space in between where that just gets interpreted and changed and what have you. And you could write a session that just looks you know, great, good structure, you know, good flow to it. And, you know, not necessarily no no ability for egos to get out of whack. And then when you actually see it in practice, you know, people are just going nuts and it's like, yeah, you you shouldn't be doing Turkish Gaps like that (laughs) or something like that. You know, so you, yeah, there's so much space in between. And, you know, that's one of the things I think um, is important is that when we look at, yeah, when we look at training um, for, say, a, a, an affiliate program compared to what we would see in, um, like, let's say, a, a program for a competitor, uh, the ideas around training and the variables and everything like that, I think it's more. Uh, I think it's important to have just a little bit uh, of a uh, a looser view on it and not necessarily be so hung up on the details because. You will go into sessions and you will go into classes that maybe you coach or maybe you don't coach or you're coaching a new group or whatever. And the way that it actually gets performed is completely different to what you wanted it to be. So, you know, I think that one of the things I I, I found to be effective was just sort of pulling back a little bit on the details of stuff and opening it opening up a little bit more into, into, uh, to interpretation, um, maybe providing a lot more detail for the coaches as to like how you can adapt things and how you can, you know, change it up or, you know, make, make the stimulus a little bit different. Um, but then at, at the same time, it could be like written out in a way which people don't see it. And they're like, Oh, that's a damn good project. That's a damn good session, but you could still, um, maybe adapt it in certain ways whereby everyone's getting what they need from it. You know, whether it's changing the volume of uh, a strength piece or whether it's changing the intention behind it. You know, like I, I remember having lots of conversations with coaches where it was like, okay, cool. Well, say for this individual over here, maybe they're going through this workout and it's like a 10 minute AMRAP. Maybe this person over here is literally just doing 10 minutes of just movement and just going through the motions. Um, and that's okay. And I think that if, if people have a little bit more of a, a view like that with uh, affiliate programming compared to like a traditional program for someone who's um, sort of have a, has a little bit more, uh, say, more objectives around it. Um, so they're training for sport or they're a competitive CrossFit athlete or something similar. Uh, I think that that's going to be helpful in the process. Um, but at the same time, you, you want to make sure that people aren't just like changing shit uh, and just, you know, doing something that's stupid. So it's sort of just trying to create... Um, yeah, like a loose plan, but at the same time, just understanding and, and also helping coaches out and educating the, the, the people in the gym 
as to how they can get the best from it and how they can get what they need from it. Um, and, you know, you can do things like level the programming. You can do things like, uh, you know, you can give people different objectives. Um, I remember, I think the, yeah, so uh, a gym that I used to work in, I think they um, pulled a, an idea from Kenny Kane uh, around practice days, mental toughness days and competition days. And it was just like this idea where you would have a context on each training session. Practice session could be like, okay, well, for this 18-minute AMRAP of hang power cleans, burpees, and toes of bar, you know, maybe this individual over here is really focusing on the hang power cleans because that's the skill that they need to work on. Maybe the individual over here is just going to be focusing on their burpees, the burpee cycle speed. Uh, maybe this individual over here is just focusing on getting their hands onto a, a little bit of a different weight on the hang power cleans, whatever it is. So those practice days could be whatever you want, wanted them to be. Uh, mental toughness day would be a little bit more of like your typical hero workout, just like, hey guys, we're just going to move for 45 minutes and uh, have a good time and make sure that we get what we need from this and uh, support each other through it. And then the competition day was a little bit more like, okay, we're going to be doing a benchmark workout. You guys did this, say, six months ago. Let's try to really push that score and uh, compete against yourself, but at the same time, create a bit of a, a competitive atmosphere. And I'll tell you what, that was actually one of the things that I think has was quite useful is just having sort of three mindsets and, and uh, lenses for your training and then just getting that across the clientele. Um, because otherwise, if every so single training day can, is the same, sometimes that can be, um, that's where you get people who are just a bit like, oh, this is boring or, you know, this is the same stuff and what have you. So I think that they're, they're having a, like a little bit more of a, a, a different outlook each day and just sort of giving people a bit more context, that's, that can be really helpful. I wanted to jump back to something you were saying about pulling back from the details because I think that that's potentially really important and valuable. Like you mentioned, for I mean, for coaching affiliates and groups, and then also for coaching individuals, right? Since a lot of the folks who are probably taking their time to listen to analytically minded nerds talk about training on a podcast may also tend to be analytic, analytically minded nerds who like the details, like the X's and O's of coaching. And like you mentioned, if you are sort of stuck on like, okay, the Turkish get up needs to be performed exactly this way, and we need to do exactly this many sets, and our total volume for this week is this amount, and we're going to hit this percentage, and you have someone who's like, I show up two times a week, and I take three weeks off randomly, and I never remember which one is a clean and which one is a snatch, right? That that's like something that can potentially be frustrating where you're like, ah, like you're doing this wrong, like you're screwing up the program, your percentages are off, whatever, right? And yes, we want people to be doing things correctly. We want people to be doing their Turkish get-ups, right? right? We want people to have some understanding, maybe not of like their exact percentages on lists, but like roughly how difficult things are. Maybe they have some idea of like rate of perceived exertion or something like that. You know, we want people to be resting properly to get the intended stimulus. We want coaches to be implementing the training programs in a way where people are actually getting the intended stimulus out of the workout, but that a lot of stuff is going to get messy and a lot of people are just going to like screw things up constantly. So being able to pull back a little bit from like, it needs to be exact Exactly this way, I think is important. Um, and there's 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 another level of challenge, sort of like you mentioned about doing that for a group environment compared to doing that for an individual. Because for an individual, you can communicate specifically with that person. They can be like, hey, listen, like busy week this week. I have a lot of stuff coming up at work. I'm traveling. You know, I tweaked my thumb so I can't do hook grip, which I actually did recently. I'm like, yeah, I can't do hook grip. Like I'm doing all my stuff, no hook. It's a lot harder this way. Um, you know, and and with an individual. A coach can kind of like turn those knobs and make stuff work. Um, whereas for a group, it's just like a little bit more ad hoc and a little bit more chaotic in terms of having those adjustments made. So I guess I'm curious for you, Luke, writing programs for groups, you know, coaching, whatever. How do you think about that right balance of details, instructions, protocols, best practices versus like, hey, listen, like there's a lot of people here who are going to just majorly screw this up but it's actually going to be okay and still a net positive for them in the long run. <clears throat> yeah, so I suppose um, to sort of circle back to like a little bit of the, the thinking behind it, I think you, so, you, you, you could have sort of two schools of thought. You could have something that's just going to be a little bit more of like an objective way of programming. This is going to be the stuff that you would typically see in strength programs. This is going to be the type of stuff that we write for athletes. 
um, there's progression, there's sort of rhyme and reason behind why you do certain things on certain days and all of this type of stuff. And then you've got the sort of view, which is going to be a little bit more uh, .com-esque, where it's like, okay, um, you know, you're going to be doing a heavy day every few, couple of weeks or like every week. Are you going to be doing, you know, a long workout every week? And it's going to be a little bit different. And maybe there's a good bit of movement interference. Maybe you're doing lower back type hinging work three days, uh, maybe not in a row, but in, in, in sort of like a close cluster. Um, but if you sort of look at like the 30,000 foot view of their fitness, like those individuals are getting fitter because they're just sort of focusing on turning up. Um, I suppose one of the things that I'm aware of is that like the more that I learn principles within programming and I try to implement them into training, the more that I was having to like dial them back. And I was having, you know, I'd put together like a, a progression for something and then I'd realize like, you know, people just aren't turning up. So it's just like, you have all of this effort put through um, but I think that you sort of have to go through that and have to learn those details in order to be able to understand and be able to categorize what people need. So one of the things I've worked in previous gyms with and, and also worked with coaches is just being like, okay, let's sort of create three avatars. We've got the individual who wants to be, uh, or the, the, the person who's just a beginner. What are the priorities for that person? Turn up three days a week, learn movements, perform them well, develop volume at sub-maximal efforts. Um, for the future you've got the, then the person who may be a little bit more intermediate they're familiar with the movements so what you need to do is sort of progress them in a in a in a way that makes sense still reel them in and make sure they're moving well and they're not getting too carried away with themselves um, uh, and also just you know I mean this is this is probably going to be the, the sort of the main chunk of people um, in your gyms right and it's just about making sure that they don't do too much but at the same time they don't do too little and then you've got those individuals who are going to be a lot more competitive. And for, the, for them, it's a lot about, about giving them a little bit more of a push, maybe telling them to, um, hey, for this workout, just don't worry about those two movements. Just focus on this movement and just try to really focus on that. And you can be a little bit more in the details on it. Um, so to sort of give you an example, like if you look at, say, uh, CrossFit.com programming, that that like deadlift 555 is, you know, that for a single session is a sort of real, you could say, that can be interpreted in so many different ways. And that's one way you could say that um, being less concerned about the details is because, you know, you're not including what they do for a warm-up. You're not including how they build up to those sets. You're not including what um, you're actually sort of seeing in terms of intensity and that type of stuff on those sets. Maybe they're doing different variations of a deadlift. Maybe someone needs to work uh, touch and go reps where someone needs to work a, uh, a reset um, each deadlift. Maybe they're doing... Uh, mixed grip or double overhand grip or so i think that you know you've got that which is a one end of the spectrum and on the other end of the spectrum is you have literally every single detail of your training written out and i think that that is probably something you don't necessarily want to be doing for your affiliate program you probably want to go in between and you want to make sure that you have a little bit more you maybe have some options on the training on the on the whiteboard uh or maybe you communicate with the coaches and you say okay, uh, if we have someone who's a little bit more advanced, maybe they need to be building up the weight each set, making sort of small jumps within a range of about, let's say, 80 to 90%. If you have someone who is uh, a beginner, we're just going to just make them do double the amount of reps, make them do 10 reps instead of five. Um, they're going to be working sort of straight weight across. And you just, if you understand the principles that say each of these avatars that you set out, they they need uh you can then just make training a lot more adaptive which i think is better because as long as i would always make a point when i was coaching of just like communicating the reason why someone is doing something so i would never like because i see it quite often where people just like in in the class environment they could maybe get frustrated and they're like do this change this and they don't really give them an explanation because of, because of it and there's just you know busy classes and that type of stuff a lot of it is just about managing bodies uh, but I would always try to make a point of just having like a, a like whatever, like three sentence conversation with someone of just like, this is the reason why you're doing this. Maybe this would be good to do this next time. Um, and, and then also just, and then opening up and sort of just sort of seeing what people were doing last time. And, you know, usually you can make good judgment. You'd be like, Hey, what was the last time you did, did deadlifts? What do you do? And they're like, I don't remember. You'd be like, okay, cool. You just do <laughs> You're just gonna do three sets of ten, all right? <laughs> just like, don't don't fuck your back up. And then maybe if someone comes up to you and they're like, 
well, I did like 87.5% for this match. And then, and then I uh, got my one rep max calculator out. So therefore my predicted max should be this. And you'd be like, okay, maybe you should chill out. <laughs> but <laughs> you can, you can, you can sort of, you can sort of gauge just off of conversation, like what people need. Um, I, yeah, I, I know that I, I'm not too sure if I really answered that question there, but I think, um, yeah, maybe the way I would go about it is just making training a lot more adaptable and just having like a bit of a context about the session. Like I said before, with the practice day, mental toughness, day, whatever you want to call them, heavy day, that type of stuff. Um, having a bit of context, having some loose sort of uh, variations around stuff and then just making sure that the communication is really sort of well put out there. Coaches know what they're doing. Athletes know what they're doing. And it's just a lot easier for people to make decisions in training as opposed to everyone just being like, this is what I do. Because I think one of the things I always used to say to people was just like, hey, this is a blueprint. Uh, you know, the whiteboard is a blueprint. This is what we want to see, ideal scenario. You know, you turn up all the time and everything like that. I, I was like, this blueprint is going to go through me and I'm going to tell you what to do. Like, maybe we have a class of 20 people. Maybe we see 20 different little variations of things going on. Okay, that's a real extreme case. But, you know, you can, you can if, if people are attentive and classes are just not administered, because I think that's one of the things a lot of people just get caught up in is like, sometimes there's so much shit that gets programmed that people can't even actually coach. They can't even actually help people make the better decisions around what they need to do for their training and educate them. It's a little bit more of just like a, do this. Okay, cool. All right, now we're doing part D. Okay, get yourselves ready. Let's go. Boom, 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 boom. All right, cool. Now we're going to go into this. Okay, cool. If you can't do this, you can do this. All right, good. All right. And then when everyone sort of finishes, it's just like, well, I did a lot of stuff. And it's like, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think uh, having those sort of, having the ability to adapt things is going to be really, really important, but just having like a good context for what you're trying to do and achieve that day is really important. Yeah, I, I heard two things in there that I think are really important that I wanted to highlight. And one of them is the idea of actually going through some stuff that's maybe a little bit more rigid and more protocol based in order to understand how that stuff works and like what the point is, right? And, you know, most people who have tried to run a very specific strength progression for a relatively large group of people potentially coming to classes has probably had the same experience that you mentioned where you're like, all right, class, like this week, we're adding five pounds to what we did last week, or we're using 87.5% of our max. And you're like, half of these people weren't here last week. Half of them don't know what their max is. This is useless. Like this isn't going to work. Right. And so I think a lot of people have an experience like that and quickly realize, hey, like we can't program these sort of like linear, rigid strength progressions because people don't show up consistently and they don't remember what they did last time and they don't know what they should be lifting. So we have to give people a little bit more leeway in terms of how to lift. But there is an element of like you have to learn the basics before you start to fiddle around with it too much, right? And I think that that's an important piece for folks. It's okay to make those mistakes and it's okay to have to go through the process of trying to port some very specific program into your group class programming and then realizing what works and what doesn't work. But then, you know, once you start to have that experience, I think something else that you started to touch on, and I don't know if you phrased it exactly this way, but what I heard was like, you have to understand what good enough is. Right. That especially for these kind of like detail oriented coaches who like to dig into the nitty gritty and read training blogs and listen to podcasts, it's like, hey, I have all these ideas about what should be happening, but I'm dealing with a bunch of people who don't care that much. Other coaches who may not care as much or get the buy in that they need to execute everything exactly how I want it to be done. And I need to have an idea of like, where is good enough? Are we above or below good enough, right? Like if we're below good enough, we have to fix that. If people are not understanding what's happening, if people's technique is completely crazy, you know, if we're not getting consistency from members, if we're getting too many complaints and people just flat out aren't showing up because they think the workouts are stupid, you know, it's like, oh, well, maybe people need to do rear foot elevated split squats and um, side planks, like we mentioned before, and like easy aerobic work. But if they literally don't come because that's what we're doing. Like, oh, like maybe we need to figure out a balance point where they get some of that stuff in, but they see something that makes them show up to the gym. So they do actually get that working, right? The, the, if we're thinking in terms of trade-offs, it's like, all right, where is good enough? Are we above or below good enough? 
And if we continue to invest our resources in terms of like focus and coaches meetings, um, communication efforts, right? Trying to get people to make changes. You can really only get people to, to work on or consider a few things at once. So if you're obsessing with whether or not everyone is like recording their scores to their workouts and it's like, guess what? Only 10% of your members give a shit at all about recording their scores. Yeah. And if you're like <laughs> dragging these people kicking and screaming and you're like, all right, like put your, get your notebook, like write it down, like go to the iPad and you have to do this, right? It's like, is that a useful investment of your energy to get people to make changes, to force them to do something that they do not give a shit about at all? Like, eh, I don't. I, I don't think it is, right? Yeah. I don't think it's that valuable to force people to record stuff if they don't care. But if you want to spend the capital, the social capital that you have with those people to get them to do that, you probably can. But I think there's other things that may be better where it's like, okay, good enough for us is here's the program. It's written in a way where people have some idea of how to progress it. The folks who actually care can keep track of things and use that to progress things over time. The people who don't care, it's structured in a way where like, yeah, it's ideal if you knew what you did last time, but it's not necessary. And we would rather focus on, you know, getting buy-in on pacing, getting buy-in on maybe some of the accessory work stuff that we want people to do that they don't love doing, getting buy-in on people doing skill work, you know, getting buy-in on people showing up consistently, right? That we would rather spend our energy and resources as coaches, as a gym, whatever, and getting those things to happen because it's like, you know, it's just not worth it to to force people to record their scores. We have other things that we think are more important. Yeah, like the when well, I sometimes sometimes I've noticed that say gyms or you know maybe um, groups uh, in the training community sometimes uh, it just becomes about the method or it becomes about the training and there's not necessarily a focus on like okay, well, why are we doing this and. You know, and then the other end of that is you maybe have have, have uh, sort of um, ways ways of thinking which are a lot more focused on you know like you hear of people talking about you got to make this the best hour of their day and all this type of thing, but at the same time they should get fitter as well. You know, so it's like it's it, there's there's lots of things that you want to balance there, and I think it's important that if you are program like like you said, if people are not turning up, it's like okay, well you're not actually helping people then. So maybe doing all the things that you think people should do doesn't help people because they don't turn up to do it. So it's like you have to, yeah, it's just, it's, I suppose it's something that's always going to be a challenge for people. Um, and if at the end of the day, most people coming into a, to, into a CrossFit gym, they may go through phases where they really, really sort of care about the, the training and stuff like that. Um, it might be the thing that they sort of, is their is their hobby? Is their sport? It's their uh, equivalent of playing uh, five side football or whatever it is, um, and they're they're sort of invested in it. Uh, but then you got a lot of people who are just there, like, yeah, I just I just need to be here because otherwise I'm going to go crazy and I'm going to kill someone at work. <laughs> uh, you know, so it's like you got to tr try and find that balance. Is is going to be really challenging? But I think being being adaptable and just yeah, like like you said, sort of just be, being being a bit more focused on bigger picture stuff, trying to get buy-in on the right things, not on the stupid little details or the, not the stupid details, but like the, the details that don't really matter at the end of the day. Right on. So, I mean, we talked through a bunch of stuff where there's trade-offs where we're trying to find this this balance between what people want and what people need. And hopefully that's helpful for people who are writing programs for affiliates, for groups, um, you know, either as a coach, uh, as someone who's being hired to do that as a gym owner, because there's just a lot to think about here, right? And, and, and it, is, it is extremely challenging. I think it's much more difficult to write an affiliate program than it is to write a program for an individual, even if that individual is, you know, training for the CrossFit Games and doing eight hours of training per day, it's much easier to be like, this is exactly what this person needs. They have a specific goal. They're bought in at least generally to what I tell them to do. Like, here we go. Let's get after it. Like, <laughs> we're going we're to send you, you know, 35 pages of training per week, but like, there, there's a pretty clear agenda here. And that's that's much less challenging, I think, than balancing all these human elements of like, is the coach going to understand what this means? Are the logistics going to work in this class? Is the class that always argues and pushes back going to be able to to get this done without giving our newest coach, you know, uh, uh, an aneurysm from stress from trying to deal with them? You know, that those are those are uh, things that aren't necessarily as like fun to think about in training as like, oh, what's the what's the best progression for like 
getting this person's power clean to to match where their their squat clean should be. You know, it's it's not not quite a not quite as uh, as fun for for folks to like digging into the details on that. 